It is our life at Coastal Life, and it should be the life of, of the believer to encounter God every day. Our mission is based on this. And we base this concept of encountering God on one thing and one thing alone. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is all that matters. And it is the gospel that the church should stand upon. Nothing else. The gospel. Why is this so important? Why does coastal life particularly put such a huge emphasis on the gospel? For one, we stand with Paul when he states to us in Romans chapter 1. He says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Paul says that I am not ashamed of the gospel. A coastal life, we are not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because, because it is the power of God for the salvation of those who believe. It's all about the gospel, and that's why it's so huge. Also, we've been commanded to preach the gospel, have we not? As believers, Christ, before he left the world, he, he gives this great commission to his disciples, and he says, go out, make disciples, preach the word, preach the gospel throughout all the ends of the world. We've been given the great commission, not just the church, but we as individuals, have been given this great calling. A lot of times, I don't know about you, but I get into this rut where I feel like it's all about the church. The church, they'll share the gospel. I don't have to. We as believers, we as people must take ownership in this calling to preach the gospel day in and day out. So often we leave it up to the church. There's great danger in this. Let me explain. And today, as it is so too often, many churches, unfortunately, are preaching a false gospel. They've either watered it down or, they're, or they've added to it. They've watered it down and their focus is not on the salvation by faith and grace alone, by God's mercy, but they water it down and saying, if you believe or if you pay a certain amount of money, you'll receive wealth, health, happiness, right? The prosperity gospel, that is a false doctrine born squarely from the pit of hell, from the deceiver himself. Also, there's this works-based gospel around where it says, you have to, you ha yeah, it's okay if I believe, but I have to do this and this and that and that and go to church and, and I have to do all these things and check off the box and then I'll be okay. That's wrong too. So we as a church, Coastal Life was formed on this very principle that we will stand upon the true gospel. It's huge. If we aren't standing upon the gospel, we're not standing on anything. And so we come this morning to, to place emphasis and treasure and protect this amazing truth. We are the bride of Christ. We are the body of Christ built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why it's important. That's why it is so huge that's why you must pay diligent attention to the gospel because we are living in urgent times, are we not? We are. And so with that in mind, I want to turn because I don't know about you, but I need reminders like this. I, like I said, I get caught up in a rut and I get lazy and I forget. And quite frankly, if I'm honest with you guys and I want to be honest, sharing my faith scares me the you-know-what out of me, you know? I'm a business guy. I'm a CPA by day, and I work with a ton of business guys, you know, and sometimes I'm just terrified to share my faith. I don't know how to do it. I'm afraid I'll jumble up the words. Um, I complicate things. Ask my wife. I like to complicate everything. I think guys do that naturally, right? So I, I just, I, you know, I'm just going to leave it up to the pastors, the church. They can handle it. They're the experts, right? That's wrong. When Jesus was giving his great commission to the disciples, the church didn't even exist. He wasn't talking to the church. He was talking to us. We are the church. He was talking to us as individuals. We are to share our faith with boldness, without shame. So how do we do that? And I asked myself this, how do I do that? And the answer that the Lord brought to me 
is in Ephesians chapter 2. And it says, go back to the basics. Don't complicate it. Just preach the gospel. Preach this truth. And so that's where we find ourselves this morning, in Ephesians chapter 2. Chapter 2. If you have it in there, I want you to follow along with me. I'm going to read. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. And in this, in this passage, we're going to discover God encountering us. Okay? God is going to encounter us in this passage. And we're going to, he's going to reveal to us three aspects of his character. We're going, to, we're going to see God's amazing love. We're going to see God's amazing grace. We're going to see God's amazing purpose in these 10 verses. So follow along with me as I read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. I want to draw your attention to verse 1 here. Encountering God reveals to us his amazing love. Before I begin, I do want to share a little bit about myself. Um, Pastor Jeff, in case you guys are wondering, he will be back. He's out uh, traveling with his family, I think, from, for the next two or three weeks, doing some, I don't know, he's doing family stuff. I want to share with you a little bit about myself, too. I, I am married. I've been married for about 14 years, a little over 14 years. Great, awesome, uh, uh, great marriage. Uh, we have three, ama- three amazing children. Um, they're sitting right there. And uh, like any typical family with three kids, or I'm sure everyone can relate, life is busy. Life is hectic uh, between basketball, dance, gymnastics, school, you name it. Life is crazy, is it not? It's crazy. We're tired. I'm looking at a bunch of, I mean, we're exhausted, right? Um, By the end of the day, a typical day for us, we've got school, activities. At the end of the day, my wife and I, we put the kids to bed. We sit on the couch and we look at each other and we've got nothing to say. You know, we're tired, we're spent. So what do we do? Like most average American couple, we turn on the TV, right? And we just zone out. And that's our, like, that's our, that's our relaxation time for, the, for 30 minutes or so. And our first part of marriage, it was all good because I would just click on Sports Center and it was great, right? Catch up on the scores and all the games. But slowly but surely, an evil, evil channel has crept into our lives. And men... If you haven't been succumbed to this channel yet, I I urge you to be on guard with this channel. Of course, I'm speaking of HGTV. HGTV. Please be aware of this channel, HGTV, all right? Um, You start watching it, and it it literally just sucks you in. You can't not stop watching this HGTV, all right? And we're watching it. My wife loves this show, a particular show. It's called Rehab Addict. Okay, I don't know if anyone's seen this show. It, it's, it's crazy. This crazy lady, right, it's her mission to buy old, dilapidated houses worth nothing. And she buys them for nothing, and she refurbishes them. I mean, she's crazy. She, she, it's like her passion. She takes, she dumpster dives, she bu- gets all this stuff, and she refurbishes these houses until they look like a million bucks. I mean, it's amazing. One episode I was watching, she literally dove into the dumpster, 
took out this table, and the table was falling apart. It was rotted. It was just nasty. I mean, worthless, meant for the dumpster. But she saw something in this table, apparently. So sure enough, she sanded it down. She stripped it down. Uh, she, I don't know what else she did to it. I'm not a craftsman, but I mean, she did all this stuff. And at the end of the day, the end of the episode, it was this amazing, beautiful, gorgeous table. I mean, meant to be fit in like the White House or something. I mean, it was amazing. I say all that. It was a great, great show, great illustration to say that that is exactly what God has done for us. Okay? The beginnings of the gospel, we have to realize where we were before Christ. It's essential, and it hurts. It's the hardest part of the gospel because we don't like to admit our wrongdoings. We don't like to admit failure. We're prideful. Nothing's wrong with us. We've got it all good. But in reality, without Christ, well, I'll just read verse 1 through 3. It says it clearly. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Doesn't get any more black and white than that, does it? We were dead. We were dead. Not physically, spiritually. We had a heart of stone. It beat for nothing. We were dead. In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. It gets worse and worse. Not only we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but we walked according to the course of this world, according to the enemy, the evil one, its ruler, Satan. We were disobedient. We lived according to our flesh, according to our lust. We indulged in the desires of our flesh, of the mind. We were by nature children of wrath. Colossians 1.21 says, We were alienated from God, enemies of God, deserving of His wrath. That was our nature. Not a pretty sight. Not a pretty sight at all. And it's the hardest part of the gospel to grasp but it's reality. Reality hurts, doesn't it? Reality is harsh. It's hard to look at yourself in the mirror and to admit you're not all right, admitting that you're helpless, hopeless. Do you remember your life before Christ? Do you? This is key because when we share our faith with someone who's dead in their trespasses and sins, if we're high and mighty, and we come across as pompous and arrogant, they're going to brush us off. If we remember where they were, if we remember where we were before Christ, remembering how helpless, how decayed, how nothing we were, we can relate to them. It's pivotal. But the story, thank the Lord, does not end there. Yes, we were dead. Yes, we gave in to every indulgence of our flesh, of our mind. We are children of wrath, even as the rest. But verse 4, look down. Verse 4, my two favorite words in all of Scripture. I live by this daily. Say it with me. But God. Say it again. But God. Praise God for these two words. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us. But God, He's rich. He's rich in mercy. That's an understatement. God is rich in mercy. He lavished His love upon us. We don't deserve it. There's nothing good about us, but God, because He loves us, gives us His mercy. Not for anything else, but because He loves us. But God, He doesn't stop there. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, even when we were dead, look at what God has done to us. He has made us alive. Not only has He given us life, He's made us alive together with Christ. He puts us equal to Christ. He makes us alive together with Him. By grace, we have been saved. He doesn't stop there. Look at verse 6. He raises us up with Him, with Christ, seats us up with Him in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. Great example of this is found in the Bible, the prodigal son. We all know it, right? Two sons, 
One son is the good guy. He does everything the father tells him to do. The other son, dad, I'm taking your money and I'm, I'm out of here. What does he do? He squanders it. He lives the way he wants to live. He's dead in his sins and transgressions. He's sleeping and eating with the pigs, for goodness sake. I mean, that's where he ends up. And all of a sudden he realizes, what am I doing? And he goes back to the father. What does the father do? Turn him away? No, he welcomes him back with open arms. He puts the robe on him. He puts the ring on him. He says, prepare a feast. My son has come home. That's what God has done with us. Remember, remember where you were before Christ. He welcomed you back with loving arms. He said, put the robe on him. Put the ring on him. This is my child. Praise. Welcome him back. Let's have a feast. He raises us up. He seats us up with him in the heavenly places. It's, to be honest with you, it's mind-blowing to me that as believers right now, we have a place in heaven seated with Christ. Can I get an amen for that? I mean, this is an amazing truth. And it's all because of God's love for us, for you and for me. This is the love of our God. He has taken us out of the dumpster. He has breathed life back into us. He has turned our heart of stone into one that beats anew. He has revived us. He has restored us. He has refreshed us. He has refurbished us. He has renewed us. This is the love of God. This is what he has done for us for no other reason at all, but because he has loved us. When you think about preaching the gospel or telling, I shouldn't say preach, sharing the gospel with someone else, remember the love of God upon your life. Remember where you've been and where you are now, positionally, and it's all because of the love of God upon you. It will change the way you share your faith with other people. It will. Let's move on. Secondly, encountering God reveals to us not only his amazing love, but also his amazing grace. Look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For by grace you have been saved. You know, I didn't really grasp this whole concept until I had kids, right? I've got three, three amazing kids, and right now two of them are sitting like angels. One is not really paying attention, but that's okay. She's six. I'll give that. I'll give her that some freedom there. But, you know, I love my children. I would do anything for them. And at times, they're not perfect, right? Anyone who has kids can attest to that. They drive you nuts. You want to wring their neck sometimes. You pull your hair out, right? It's hard being a parent. It's hard. I, I have not done anything harder in my life than being a parent. Can I get an amen for that one? Yes, right? But, you know, you just want to, uh, you know, sometimes you get so frustrated. But then you have those moments, and they come to you first thing in the morning, and they just, hey, Dad, good morning. I love you. And it's like you forget about everything. And you're like, oh, my precious son, my precious daughter, what can I do for you? Can I make you breakfast? What can I do for you? You know, you want to show them grace and you, want, you would do anything in the world for them. You would lay down your life for them because you're their dad. You're their mom. You love them. It's undeserved favor. Now, we as parents, how we mess it up all the time, we show grace. Think about how much our Heavenly Father shows us grace. Undeserved favor. And it's through faith. I want to pay attention to this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. What does it, what does it mean to have faith? To have faith. We must believe it. We must believe the gospel. How do we get faith? Is it something that just pops in us? Something we just go to sleep one night and wake up, oh, I've got faith. No, the Bible, I've always wondered that. 
The Bible tells to us clearly in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. Let me repeat that. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. By reading the Bible, by hearing preaching, by by preaching the word and, and studying the word, we receive our faith. We learn it, we hear it, we study it, and God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, illuminates us, opens our eyes, and he gives us the faith. It's like all of a sudden, I get it now. I understand. My, my pre-algebra teacher always used to call that an aha moment when we were studying algebra and we didn't get it, and all of a sudden, we got it. it was, she called it an aha moment. It's like we're studying, we're reading, we're hearing all this stuff, and all of a sudden, boom, we get it. I get it. I have faith. I understand that comes from God. He gives us the faith to understand. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. That's why it's so pivotal to hold our pastors accountable, right? We need to pray for them. We need to love them. We need to question them, what they're preaching, because they have an amazing and awesome responsibility as they preach the word to us. We're not to be just to listen and hear it and take it for, for granted. We're to be like the Bereans who, who listened to the scripture, listened to the pastors, and went back in home and studied it to make sure what they were saying was accurate. We need to do that with our pastors. That's out of love. That's out of love. It's so important because that's how we receive our faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. And it's not a result of our works, verse 9 says. It's not a result of our works. Why? So that no one may boast. In the gospel, God gets all the credit. Nothing is due to us because we've done nothing. We don't deserve it. He gets the glory. He gets the fame. He gets all the credit because it's just to him. He's God. He's holy. He's omnipotent. How great is our God? Our soul should be screaming out, crying out, God, you are so great. You are worthy. I am nothing. You receive all the glory and honor. We do not boast. We only boast in him and him alone. Lastly, and this, this is so great. I love this about the gospel because, yes, we remember where we were, who we were before Christ, and God saves us by his love and grace and mercy by grace through faith alone. But he doesn't end there. He doesn't just save us and leave us be. No, God saves us for purpose. Let's read verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Encountering God reveals to us his amazing purpose for our life. Did you know you and I were created for a purpose? We were. God created us for one reason and one reason alone, and that was to glorify him, to show him off. And that's why God saves us. He saves us so that people can look at you and your actions and see something different about you. In your workplace, where you go to school, people should see if you are a believer they should see something different about you. And that's the good works that God places in you. He's prepared beforehand so that now when you're saved, you can walk in those good works. And it's not just good works, it's for his glory. It's, he's not saying there that works save us. He's saying there, once we are saved, those good works are evident from our faith. God saves us to show himself off. I think of when we were, I don't know, many years ago, we knew a family, and this was a crazy family. They, their house, you go to their house, and it was like chaos all the time. They had three or four kids, and one day they decided, they told us, you know what, we really feel like we want to adopt some more kids, and we we're like, you guys are crazy. You guys are, this is a chaotic household, and you want to adopt some more kids? But this was their heart. They loved children. And so they took in these foster kids. And there were three kids from out in Indian Town, and they had a horrible home life. They were kicked out. They were from foster home to foster home to foster home. D 
deplorable living conditions, but they were so little. They were just precious, these little precious kids, and they took them in. I remember when we went over their house, and we met them for the first time, and they were just like ragamuffins, hair all over the place. You know, if you've ever seen, you know, Snoopy and Charlie Brown, that guy that is around and it's like dirt ball that fall. And that, that's what these kids were. And one of the kids, little boy, his name was Josh. And he kind of drew to me because of my son is named Josh. And, uh, you know, we kind of connected. Um, anyway, so the family took a man and they fostered them. And, and we, they, they kind of moved away. And they came back about a year later. And we met with them again. And the kids were changed. I saw something different in them. And I went up to Josh, and before he he walked around with his head down, you know, just disheveled. And this time he looked at me, and he shook my hand. And he's like, hi, Mr. Robert, how are you? So good to see you. I'm like, Josh, what what happened to you? You know, you're you're this young man. What's going on? And he, he said this to me, and I'll never forget it. He says, Mr. Robert, I have a new name. I've been adopted. I have a new name. My daddy gave me his name. He got it. Now that he was adopted, he was a child of this this dad, and he was able to walk according to the family. He was a family member. He had he'd inherited all that they had provided. He was a child of his. That's us. God has adopted us. We have his name. He calls us by name. We're his children. We have received his inheritance, his blessing that he prepared beforehand. Look at verse 10. God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. He prepared before the beginnings of the earth. This is mind-blowing to me. Before you even were formed in the womb, God prepared his purpose for you to walk in them. And now that you're saved, now that, you've, now that he calls you as his own, you can walk in that. What a great freedom, amen? That's the gospel. That's the gospel. God reveals his love to us. He reveals his grace to us. And he reveals his purpose to us. That's the gospel. And so, if you go and you're afraid to share your faith, remember his amazing love. Remember his amazing grace. Remember his purpose for your life and go and share boldly because God is going before you. God is the one who will save. He just asks us to share, share our life, be real with others. It's not about being fake or coming across like you know it all. It's just being real, remembering where we were, remembering what God has done in our life and remembering what he has in store for us. That's the gospel. That's why we encounter, we want to encounter God every day. That's why we as a church want to facilitate that in our lives, to give us the opportunity to encounter his amazing love, his amazing grace, and his amazing purpose for our life. That's encountering God. That's encountering God. To close, there might be some of you out there that like, what is this guy talking about, encountering God? I want to share with you the gospel. You see, God created you for a purpose. He created you to live for him, to glorify him. He, he put Adam and Eve, the, for our first parents, in a perfect situation, in the garden, paradise. They had everything for them, all the food they can eat, I mean, they got to name the animals. You know, that that would be a cool thing to do. They got to name the animals. They got to control the animals. They had everything in place. It was perfect. But he gave, God gave them one rule. Don't eat from this tree. Just don't do it. Because he loved them. He knew that it would be bad for them, right? But what happened? In the midst of that paradise, they messed it up. Eve was tempted by Satan. Satan lied to her. This won't hurt you. This will make you wise. You'll be like God. So Eve ate. And Adam, we always like to blame Eve, you know. Adam, he is much to blame as anybody. He didn't protect his wife. He didn't stand firm on the truth. He gave in as well. 
sin crept in at that time. Because of that, because God is a holy and perfect God, he kicked him out. He cannot be around sin. He can't stand it. So he banished them to live a life of labor and toil. Time went on. God did not just leave him with that. I go back to the, my favorite two words, but God. But God had a plan. He gave his only son, a part of himself, to come down, to live on the earth, to live the perfect life, to die the death that we deserve. We deserve, because of our sin, we deserve eternal separation from God. The Bible is clear on that. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It also says, for the, says, for the wages of sin is death. We deserve that. But our Lord, Jesus Christ, took that punishment because he was acting in obedience to the Father. He took it. He bore the nails. He bore the pain. He bore the torture because he was being obedient to the Father. Because the Father loved us so much, he chose to kill his own son on behalf of us. And when God, when Jesus was on the cross and we cried out, when he was bearing our sin, our past sin, our sins now and the sins we'll ever commit, he bore all that. God, the Father, could not bear to look at him. He couldn't. So he bore, God the Father bore his wrath upon his only son for us because he loved us. And we hear Jesus cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because at that instant, he was separated from his father because of our sin. We deserve to be up there. But then he says, it is finished. And he breathed his last breath and he died. But God, but God, through his power, raised up Jesus on the third day. So Christ conquered death, he conquered our sin, and he became the perfect sacrifice. So that all who would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the gospel. We have to believe that. Nothing, we don't have to do anything. All we have to do is believe. Believe. Have the faith that Jesus did that. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? If that's you this morning, I don't want to let this opportunity slip by. You might, this is my first time here, and I don't know anyone here. So I don't know if we're all believers or if someone here is struggling with this. And maybe this is, maybe you've been grappling this for some time now. You don't know where you are. You don't know where you stand with God. I, I want to give you this opportunity now. The Bible says you don't have to walk down an aisle. You don't have to do anything, sign a piece of paper. You just have to believe. You have to have the faith that Jesus was who he said he was, that he did what he said he did, that he conquered what he said he conquered. You might say a prayer like this. Remember, you have to remember your condition before Christ. You might say, God, I get it. I know I'm a sinner. I know that I'm helpless and desperate for you. God, forgive me. I confess my failures, all that I've done. Lord, I lay it at your feet. And God, I ask that you would forgive me right now. I believe in you. I believe that your son was who he said he was. I believe that you sent your son to live for me, to die for me. God, I place my faith in you and you alone. Lord, change me. Change my heart. Help me to live for you. God, thank you for loving me, for your grace, for your mercy.